Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be at Remnant Park Church with you this morning. I want to honor Pastor Leo Norris and Sister Norris for allowing me to be with y'all. I honor my pastor back home. I'm from the Pentecostals of Katy. My wife and I met there. Church is not just a blessing because we get to be in relationship with God, but I found my wife at church, at, and, and it was another blessing. And now we have a little girl that we have uh, been starting another journey or a uh, you know, a new part of our life, a new chapter in our life, and that's fun. Some of you parents know what that's all about, and we didn't, and now we do. And I've, I've, I've uh, learned to respect my friends that have kids, especially those that have more than one, because I'm like, you did this with every kid? So I'm like, wow, um, praise the Lord. But it is a tremendous blessing, and I have learned a lot about God through having a child. You know, it, your senses go up. And you know your 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 protection. You're wanting to provide, and you're wanting to protect, and you're wanting to love. It's somehow that dial goes up, and it it makes me it reminds me that our heavenly Father thinks the way thinks the same way for us as we do for our children. And the Bible says that if us being evil know how to give good things to our children, how much more our heavenly Father will give unto us. So if we love our kids and want to do the best for our kids, how much more our Heavenly Father, who's perfect, who has no flaws. And I just want to remind everybody here that we are children of God. Amen. So I did want to share something with you. I, I think I always like coming to church because every time I come to church, I leave better. Uh, and I, I sometimes I think of coming to the house of God as almost like going to your favorite aunt's house or your mother-in-law's house or your grandma's house. There's always something good there to eat, you know, and you're always going to live with something sweet or something good. And I hope that I brought something fresh for you this morning. I feel like the Lord put this on my heart and, um, and I, I um, want to share with y'all. I won't take too much of your time because there's nothing worse than the preacher that goes on too long, right? <laughs> but I hope that I can share um, and be a blessing with you this morning. We are going to read from the book of Acts this morning in chapter 8. We're just going to uh, read a couple of scriptures in chapter 8, and then we'll move over to chapter 9, and we'll read a couple of scriptures there. And this is a story that we all know probably pretty well, but uh, like what my pastor says, he don't get to the end of the story without me. Okay, <laughs> let's get to the end together. So if you could open your Bibles or open your app to Acts, Acts chapter 8, we're going to read verse 1 and verse 3, and then we'll move over to, um, we'll move over to chapter 9. And in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at the time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And if you go down to verse 3 with me, and it says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hauling men and women, committed them to prison. And if we can go to verse 9, we continue to see what's going on in in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, it says, And Saul, yet breathing, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he find any of this way, whether they be men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And just two more scriptures. In verse 8 and 9, in that same chapter, we're going to read where it says, And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand, and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither did he eat nor drink. Amen. With this uh, scripture, I want to share just a simple thought with you this morning on the moment everything changed. The moment everything changed. 
There's a story of a young couple recently married that is celebrating their first Thanksgiving together. The bride wants to cook her hu to her husband her family's classic turkey recipe, and she asks her mom for this recipe. Her mother sends her the recipe, and the woman cooks it to perfection. Everything is perfectly tender and juicy. However, at the end, her, uh, her husband asks, Darling, where are the legs? Where are the drumsticks? I always like those the best. And she says, They're on the side. And he picks around the bird, and he seems confused, and she points them out. And he asks, But love, why are they shaped like that? It doesn't look like a drumstick at all. And she said, Well, the recipe, it says, this, this is how we've always done it. You take the legs off, you take the bones out, and you cook the meat on the side. And he still doesn't understand, but the turkey was very tasty, so he leaves it alone. And how many men know, just leave it alone sometimes, right? <laughs> the next day, the woman calls up her mother and asks, So mom, about the turkey recipe, why do we take the bones out and cook the meat on the side? And her mother replies, I don't actually know why. Your grandmother just always did it that way, and it's her recipe. So later on, the mother of the bride, of the new bride, and the grandmother were having brunch, and the question of the turkey comes up one more, once, once again. I gave my daughter your turkey recipe, and she asked about the turkey legs. What about them, asked the grandmother. Well, why do we cut them off, take the bones out, and cook the meat on the side? And the grandmother bust, busted out laughing, and she said, I did that when you were a kid because my pan was too small to fit the whole turkey. So you see, it's easy to become a follower or a doer of something without truly understanding why, especially when we follow people that we love or people that we trust. So Paul is no exception. Here we read one of the Bible's most interesting interactions of God with man. Quickly, we get a peek at Paul's early resume and find out that he's on a self-appointed holy crusade. He has recognized that there is a new sect rising among the Jews, and they are shaking his world. And somehow, they're all connected to this man recently crucified, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, everybody in town has heard of Jesus. Some call him a prophet. Some call him a teacher. Some say he's the Messiah, as foretold by prophecy. There are stories of how he ate with publicans and sinners how he teaches and taught a doctrine of love and forgiveness. There's, there are rumors that he even raised people from the dead. Some say that he gave sight to the blind and even the lame to walk again. And, and how he was rejected by the people in power. But the people, people, followed him in droves. Anybody know about the Jesus I'm talking about? I want to clear up a rumor. This is no rumor. This was God robed in flesh. He came to the earth to his own. He was crucified and buried, but he did not stay in the grave. He rose on the third day in glory. Amen. Death, hell, and the grave defeated forever. But the best news is that he did it for you and I. We don't have to fear anymore. What will, what will happen when my time is up? I can tell you today that if you follow Jesus, only victory awaits you only streets of gold, only everlasting life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. In Ephesians, we see where it's written that there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. So the rumor was true back then, and it is today. Jesus is God and Lord. Amen. He is Savior and provider. He is protector. He will he will watch over his people. Clap your hands if you believe that this morning. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. And even better, his presence is in this place today. If you give him a chance, he can bless and change your life forever. So back to Paul, <clears throat> or Saul, because he hasn't been Paul yet. Being zealous because of what he knows to be truth, sets out to rectify what he sees as religious corruption among the Jews, right? He is encouraged by the religious leaders of that day, leaders he sat under and learned under, and those who run Jewish society. They too don't like these so-called Christians who are different in so many ways than the rest of the Jews. Paul is on a mission. We can't allow this to go much longer. We, we have to crush this rebellion and put things as they were before this Jesus appeared. So we, fall, we find Saul. He hasn't become Paul, right? He's, we find Saul. 
He is well connected. He gets written authority. That's what those letters were. So like, they were like warrants. Anybody know about warrants? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Saul has warrants to go and find these, to find any Jews that follow Jesus or call themselves Christians. Tie them up, bind them up, and bring them all the way to Jerusalem to be sentenced. These warrants were so harsh, the author of the book of Acts made it a point to say whether they be men or women. Somebody turned to a sister and say they were looking for women folk too. <laughs> now, I don't know if you guys know, even the mob back in the day said no women, no children. But Paul or Saul, he was on a different level. He was binding up men and women and bringing them to be arrested and, and convicted. So we need to understand, brother and sister, dear saint, dear child of God, that we as the church have to be ready for whatever the future may hold, whatever challenges may come our way, whatever storms might come our way, what storms might arise in the day that we live in, what stumbling blocks and what weird ideologies may appear. We already see a big shift and change in society, a change in how the church is perceived, and we are the church. We can't call sin, sin, because they call us hateful. We can't say this is wrong because you are in the wrong. We can't say this about that because then we're labeled hypocrites and bigots. We can say something is unrighteous because they state we are unrighteous for pointing it out. But church, we better be ready for what may come. Just as much as you and I take plan, take plan to work out our day, to work out our schedules, to make sure we don't miss any appointments, we better also do what scripture says and be sober, be vigilant. Be because your adversary is as the devil is as a roaring lion walketh seeking whom he may devour. Just as much as you and I spend time, and I love spending time with my daughter, just like you might spend, love spending time with your children, you love snuggling them and kissing them and showing them affection. We better train up a child in the way he should go so when he is old he will not depart from it. Just as much as we make sure that our hair is combed and our tie is straight and our clothes is nice and ironed, we better also put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Amen. If you don't know, if you don't see what's going on, we have to wake up. It's important that we recognize what's going on in the world. We understand that soon the Bible says that they'll call evil good and good evil. Amen. But we must always remember what is true, what is real. We have to make sure that we understand that we are at war. We are at war with the enemy to maintain and protect the innocence of our children. We are at war with ungodliness and hate being stirred up in the hearts of men. We are at war to maintain some type of semblance of holiness in our nation. Church, it's going to take you and I to stand for truth. It's going to take you and I not to waver in the winds of adversity. It's going to take you and I to hold on to God's word when man's word says differently. Amen. So let's get back to Saul. Saul is headed to Damascus with these warrants, ready to lock up Christians. I don't know if Saul was in a good mood. I don't know if he was bad mood. I don't know if he was whistling. I don't know if he was singing. Uh, one little, two little, three little Christians, four little, five. <laughs> you know, I don't know what was going through his mind, but he was on a holy mission in his mind. He, he, he thought he was right in what he was doing. So if, you're, if you feel like you're in God's will and you're in God's purpose, I, I think we all walk different. We talk different. We feel different. We're joyous because I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm doing my father's business. I'm doing something right. This is bigger than me. So we, I don't know what Paul was doing, if he was singing to himself or what was, what was happening, but the Bible says, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly sh there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? When he says, who art thou, Lord, he's asking, who are you, Master? Who are you, God? Who are you? Who, are, who am I speaking to? 
That's when he's when he's when he's replying to God. When he's he's he has this light shine. He has a supernatural experience, and he hears his voice speaking to him and calling him by name. He then replies, "Lord, who are you? You know, I thought I was doing your work. I thought I was I was working for you. I thought I was doing your business. Who are you, Lord?" And that voice, the Lord says, "I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest." A light from heaven shined only on Saul. This is, I think this is the verse that a lot of old school preachers used to use to remind you that God could strike you down if he wanted to. <laughs> he can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you if he wants to, if he needs to. I grew up in a generation that they, they said if you looked at the pastor cross-eyed, you'd get struck by lightning. <laughs> uh, so we see this this. Um, this supernatural experience, this light shine from heaven only on Saul. Here is where the moment everything changed. God did not say, why do you persecute my people? Why do you persecute my church? He didn't even say, why do you persecute my children? God said, why do you persecute me? You see, when somebody messes with the church, and a reminder, you and I are the church. The church is in the building. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. When somebody messes with the church, when somebody tries to mess with God's people, they aren't just messing with Brother Smith or Sister Nancy. When somebody messes with the church, God takes it as you are messing with me. So that's why we need to be encouraged this morning. So be encouraged, brother. Be encouraged, sister. If you feel that the enemy has come after you to persecute or torment you, they are in big trouble because God takes it as you are messing with him. If you mess with the church, you're messing with God. And the best news is God has never lost a battle. God has never lost a fight. He's never been defeated. His throne has never been taken away. Deuteronomy says, ye shall fear them. Ye shall not fear them for the Lord your God shall fight for you. And this is another more important reason that we need to stay in the church. We need a pastor. We all need somebody that's got our back. We all need somebody that we can work together with for the kingdom's sake. Jesus said that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. Talking about the church. We need the church. We need each other. We need to be connected. Amen? Amen. Some of you parents know exactly what I'm talking about. Let somebody mess with your baby. Let somebody mess with your child. Sometimes we forget we have the Holy Ghost. Somebody, <laughs> somebody messing with my kid. I heard a comedian say, when I met my wife, I knew that I would die for her. But when I met my child or when I met my daughter, I knew I would kill for her. <laughs> Amen. We need to understand how, how important we are to the Lord, how important we are to God. The Bible says that he is our heavenly father. Heavenly Father. I love to think that because I grew up without a father. I understand what it is not to have one in your life. So when you, when I can now say, I have a Heavenly Father that's watching over me, that he, op he opens and closes doors when I ask him for wisdom. It's his word says he'll give it to me because I'm seeking wisdom. I'm not seeking glory. I'm not seeking power. I'm not seeking riches. I'm, I'm seeking just wisdom, God, so I, I know how to act and I know how to, you know, to make the right decisions, not just for me, but for my family, for my friends, for anybody that, that I can be a blessing to. Lord, give me the wisdom that I can, I can speak properly. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, he, he fills in the gaps that we have in our lives, the weaknesses that we, that we often feel. Lord, I'm not adequate. Lord, I can't do that. I'm nobody. Lord, I don't have, I don't have the skills. God makes up the gap. Speaking of testimonies, says we, I have heard several testimonies, and myself have, have, been, uh, have been blessed by, by uh, in positions and in, um, in, in, in business and finance because, because of just God showing favor on my life. Amen. He, he makes up the gap where I don't have the experience, where I don't have the qualifications, where I don't have. He adds. He adds the favor. He adds his hand. Amen. So if you are in need, if you're looking for something, if if, if you need just God's favor on your hand, you can claim that today. 
You just say, Lord, you're my heavenly father. I know that you want the best for me, Lord. And I know that every blessing, and you can't, it's got to mean it when you say it. Lord, every blessing that you pour on me, I'm pouring back to you, back to you for your glory's sake, Lord. I'm going to be faithful in my time. I'm going to be faithful in my consecration. I'm going to be faithful in my finances. I'm going to be faithful in all the areas of my life, right? Because we want all the areas of my life, our lives to be blessed, don't we? Amen. So that's another reason that we must understand the importance of being in the church. Because when somebody messes with the church, they're not just messing with us. They're, God takes it as you're messing with me. You now put, pick a fight with the almighty God, the creator of the universe, the Alpha and the Omega. He has never lost a battle. Some of us know exactly what it's like if somebody makes a move or tries to hurt our children, how angry we can get, how furious we can get, how our senses immediately turn on. Imagine the God that knows all things. He knows everything. He's the author and the finisher of the faith, the Bible says. He knows every end to every story. He knows the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. We can trust in him, but we got to stay in the church. We got to get plugged into the church. We got to be faithful to our church. Amen. Here's the point that I wanted to make. Saul, when he arose from the earth, when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. Everybody say no man. He didn't see anything. He was led by the hand and brought into Damascus. And the Bible says that he was there for three days without, without sight. Neither did he eat nor drink. And I probably wouldn't have been able to eat anything either <laughs> if you had that type of experience, right? Back to what we, what's going on at Saul. God didn't send an angel to take Saul out. And we see in the Old Testament that God had angels sometimes destroy whole armies by themselves. The men didn't have to do anything. The children of Israel didn't have to do anything. We see those examples in the Bible. God didn't, didn't strike Saul dead. And we see examples in the Old Testament where God you know, struck down an evil king. Like he's done, he, he could do any of that. God didn't wither Saul's hand for, for raising his hand against the church. And we've seen that. We've seen God heal withered hands and also wither, you know, natural objects. We didn't, he didn't do that. God didn't even plague Saul with leprosy, right? Which we've seen, we've seen examples of that as punishment. But what happened to Saul? When he arose from the earth, he opened his eyes, but saw no man. He saw nothing. He lost his sight. God was wrapping up this moment for Paul and putting a bow on it as to say, which you thought you were seeing what was right. You thought you were doing what was right, but you were wrong. You were not just wrong. You were spiritually dark. You couldn't. You were in the darkness spiritually, and now you're in the dark physically. But when I'm done with you, Saul, you will see the light both spiritually and physically when I heal you. Amen. We need to be reminded that God doesn't want us just to see, walk by faith. Walk. We also need to believe. We need to walk in, walk in his truth. Know that he's with us spiritually and physically. Know that he's with us, that he wants to guide and lead us and direct us. Paul was in a situation where he thought he was doing what was right, and he was completely wrong. Like the story that we thought we, we read earlier, they were just following what has always been done. They were just following what they thought was to be true, but he, Paul was completely wrong at the moment. We've all heard that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Anybody heard that before? Good intentions aren't enough to get us to heaven. Good intentions aren't enough to, get, to change our life. I want to lose weight. I want to be super strong. But just thinking of it, it's not enough. I'm not going to gain muscles overnight just thinking of it, just wishing it. I'm not going to lose 30 pounds just thinking on it. I've, i got to do something. There has to be some action. There needs to be some action, right? The Bible even says faith without works is dead. You can believe all you want, but if you don't put some action with that faith, nothing's going to come about. We have to do something. There needs to be some action to see some results. It's, it's time, like, you, like Saul, that you and I say, what will thou have me do, Lord? Lord, what is it that you want me to do? What is it that you want me to do, Lord? The Bible says to get into covenant with God, we must obey the simple gospel. We must repent of our sins. True repentance isn't just asking God for forgiveness, 
but it's saying, Lord, I, I ask you, Lord, forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for what I've done. Not only, Lord, do I want you to forgive me, but I am going to do something too, Lord. Remember, there has to be some action. I'm going to change. I want to change. I'm going to work at changing my actions. If I was headed in this direction, true, re true repentance means I'm no longer headed in that direction. I'm changing the way I'm walking. I'm going this way now. I'm, I'm leaving where I was headed, and I'm going in a completely different direction. That's true repentance, not just asking God for forgiveness, and He will forgive us. The Bible says He's faithful and just to forgive us. But we are now saying, Lord, I'm leaving. I'm going in a completely different direction because I want to change. There's some action that I need to put behind my decision, right? I'm deciding to be a new person, Lord. I'm making up my mind. I'm walking in a totally new direction. The Bible says we also need to be baptized according to how Scripture states, not how I say, not how my wife says. My wife is very smart, but not her opinion doesn't matter when it comes to this. It's what the Bible says. Amen. The Bible says that we need to be baptized in the only saving name, the name of Jesus. The Bible says that baptism is for the remission of sin. So when you ask God for forgiveness, he forgives you. But guess what? Stain, sin has a way of staining our lives, staining our souls. Now imagine if I came over to your house and invite me sometime <laughs> and I accidentally spill something on the carpet, you know, and, and I'm like, I'm so sorry. I, you know, I have clumsy hands or, you know, let me help you clean it up. And we clean it up and I'm, I, I keep asking you for forgiveness and you're like, don't worry. It's OK. I forgive you. Don't worry about it. Guess what? You forgave me, but there's still a stain there. We have to do something to get that stain out. That's what baptism in Jesus' name, it gets the stain of sin out of our lives. Yeah. God forgives us. We have been forgiven, but now not just that, the stain has been washed away. Remember where the scripture says that we'll be as white as the whitest cloud, as white as snow? That's where baptism in Jesus' name comes and washes sin away. So sin is, com sin is completely washed away. There's no stain, no stain on our lives anymore. And lastly, just like Paul, had a supernatural experience. There is a supernatural experience for you and for I. That's the infilling of the Holy Ghost. You can receive the Holy Ghost this morning. You just have to take a step of faith. Remember, take some action. It takes some action to have a change. If you've already done all those three, th three things and you just need a touch of God for your mind or for your heart, if you just need a touch of strength from God, you can have that this morning too. I want to ask us to stand together so we can pray together this morning. If you'd like to take some action and come to the front and let us pray for you, I'd like to pray for you, let you know that God is here. He's ready to make a difference in our lives. If you're not, if you're not giving up, He's not going to give up. I always say if you take one step towards God, He'll take two steps towards you. Amen. You're not going to put more effort in than God is going to put in more effort. You're not going to work harder than God's going to work to to make sure that you are not only saved, but you are blessed, that you are strong, that you are living in the, a prosperous life, in a purpose driven life, in a godly life. Amen. Let's pray this morning together. Thank you, Lord.